Well, if you get my Friday email, uh, you know that I've said, I think the last two weeks, how much I love Advent. My favorite time of the church year uh, as we look forward with excitement, anticipation uh, to celebrating the birth of Christ. Um, And, you know, when I grew up, Christmas was an incredible, incredible family time for us. There, but there was no mention of Christ, no reference to Christ. The whole reference was to family, and I loved it. But I remember I came to Christ in April 1980, that first Christmas of 1980, my first Christmas as a believer, everything changed. It just All of a sudden, I knew what the real purpose is, and family's a part of it. I love it. But that Jesus Christ came, was born, lived and died for us. So, Father, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for the reminders that we have all around us this time of year of what Christ did and who he was. So I pray this morning that you bring life to the words that I'm about to speak, that only the truth would go forth and only the truth would be received. And I ask it in Christ's wonderful and glorious name. Amen. Well, over the next several weeks, uh, we are going to have tons of reminders about what seasons, season that we are in. We're going to go into malls, we're going to listen to the radio, and we're going to hear uh, Christmas carols, and we're going to see uh, Chris, um, TV shows uh, about Christmas. And uh, sadly, many of them miss the, the purpose of Christmas. There's, there are these kind of syrupy, gushy, romance things that don't say a single thing about Jesus the whole time. And, and so we're going to hear all kinds of reminders. We're going to hear all sorts of references uh, to Jesus. Uh, and the story will be told and retold over and over and over again. But even if those stories do reference Christ, they don't seem to really understand so many about what this is all about, what Christ is all about, what, what Bethlehem is all about. So many people today have the facts, but they don't seem to understand those facts. They don't seem to understand what they're all about. And so we celebrate Advent every year. We celebrate Christmas every year. Remember as Christians that Jesus came uh, as a baby to, to, to live on earth, was born in the way that every other baby is born. The question is, what Jesus are we talking about? Are are we talking about the the Muslim prophet? Are we talking about the New Age teacher, the the rebel against Rome who stood up for the oppressed? Are, are, Are we talking about the social revolutionary, the wise teacher, the healer? Which Jesus are we talking about when we talk about him, especially this time of year? Well, here's the thing that I find for so many people today. Whatever Jesus it is that they believe in, he seems to be this very harmless kind of person. He's gentle, he's loving, and he will never challenge us to grow. He'll never challenge us to change. He'll never challenge us to be better than we are today. He just kind of accepts everybody. And I agree that that's true. But as you've often heard, Jesus loves us just as we are. But he loves us too much also to leave us that way. But for so many people today, this Jesus, their Jesus, would never do those things. Would never push somebody to grow. I don't know if you ever heard of a book called, uh, It's Jesus I Love, I Can't Stand the Church. And I happened to see it on a shelf one time, and I picked it up, and I started to read it. And I just glanced through it, flipped over pages. And you know what? The Jesus that they believe in isn't the Jesus of the Bible. Of course they can believe in that Jesus. He'll let them do whatever they want. They can live anywhere they live. They can believe in any God they want. And it's all okay. It's a false Jesus. 
And that's the Jesus I think we're going to see during this time of year. So the next few weeks, during Advent, we are going to be looking at this whole issue of who is this Jesus. And we're going to look at it in different ways from different angles. And this week, we are going to look at this clear, clear demonstration by the Bible, in the Bible, that says that this baby, this baby that was born in an entirely normal way to normal parents, was not a normal baby. He was and he is God. God in the flesh. And so in Philippians chapter 2, Paul admonishes, and we looked at this as we preached through Philippians, that Paul admonishes the Philippian church to be servant-like and to live as servants and to have and develop a servant mentality. And then he says, basically, in the passage that Josh read, he basically says, Do you want to know what that looks like? Do you have any clue what it looks like to be a Christian, to to be a servant? He says, look to Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be a real servant, look to Jesus. And as he describes this, as he describes Jesus and how he lived such a life, we probably have one of the most powerful pictures of Christ that we have anywhere in Scripture. And we find some answers to this question, who is this Jesus? We see who Jesus really is in this passage. And as we understand who Jesus really is, we understand why do we celebrate Christmas? And so the first thing we see is that we celebrate Christmas because Jesus is fully God. You see, all those other pictures, the other ideas that people have about Jesus, the one thing that they all agree on is that he's not God. He was all those other things that I mentioned, but he wasn't God. But this passage tells us right away In verses 5 and 6, the first couple of verses of this, he tells us, and he says, and it's bold, and it's powerful, and he says, Jesus, being in very nature God, hold on to those those two words, very nature, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. And and so many of the religious views today and the cults, the one thing that they almost all do that I'm aware of is is deny the deity, the, the godness, we could say, of Christ. And they would say that Jesus is God only in the same way that you and I are, is that we all reflect God in some way. And so that makes us all gods. And that's something that we hear so much today. But this phrase, very nature, describes what a person is in the very core of their being, in the very essence of their being. It's something that cannot be changed. It describes that part of humanity, which always and in all circumstances remains the same. The very essence of who you are. And so Paul begins this section of Scripture, and he says that that Jesus is essentially and unchangeably God. And Paul is very careful in how he chooses his words here. Jesus was fully God and is fully God. Now, to so many in the world today, this is an astonishing claim. It's astonishing. Muslims don't believe that. Mormons don't believe it. Jehovah Witnesses and, and many others. They would consider such a, such a, a statement to say that Jesus is God. It's, it's ridiculous. It's foolishness. It's heresy. They believe that Jesus was a good man. And they may even call him a savior. But friends, understand something. When somebody says, Jesus is my savior... Ask them what they mean by that. Because I will tell you that in so many of these groups, 
When they say Jesus is my Savior, they do not mean the same thing that we mean when we talk about Jesus being our Savior. Many years ago, I was at a, a seminar in Regina, and it was a man by a man, a New Testament scholar, that I knew was not a, a conservative evangelical scholar. And so somebody asked him, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And he said, well, of course I do. But see, I'd read some of his works, and I could have left it. But if you think I was going to leave it, you don't know me very well. And so I put my hand up, and I said, can I ask you another question regarding the resurrection? Yes. Do you believe in the actual bodily, physical resurrection of Christ? And all of a sudden, he had to start backing down, because he didn't. And see, that's what happens so much today, even regarding the Savior. What do you mean when you have those two guys come to your door? You know, they're dressed in white, shirt, black pants. And they say, well, Jesus is my Savior too. Ask them, what do they mean by Savior? And I can tell you that it's not the same thing that we believe. Now, in case you think this is just Paul, John also says that Jesus is fully God. He says in John 1, 1 to 14, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the very beginning, when the world was first created, he's saying. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Jesus is God. And throughout the Bible, there are these direct references that we've looked at, and there's these indirect references that talk about Jesus as the, the Alpha and the Omega, the, the beginning of time and, and, and the end of time. And, 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 and Thomas calls him, my God. And Jesus made direct claims about himself. He says in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. I have always been. I will always be. John 8, 16, I and the Father are one. John 14, 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, I don't know everyone in this room really well. And you may be here this morning, but you don't know where you are with all this God stuff and all this Jesus stuff. And you may wonder, you know, is the Bible true? Some of you know that at one point in my life, I said the Bible was written by people stoned on opium. That's what I believed. And you may not believe what the Bible says. But if you believe it or not, you cannot deny one thing. The Bible clearly and distinctly uh, declares that Jesus is God. And so, as Jesus, if, if Jesus said it and knew he wasn't, that means he's a deceiver and we shouldn't follow him. We actually should avoid him. If he wasn't God and he said he was God, then maybe he had mental problems and we shouldn't follow him either. But see what the Bible says and what I believe with all of my heart is that he is God. And that he deserves my loyalty, my complete loyalty, my complete obedience. And if he's not who he says he is, then we should just shut off the lights, sell the building, and move on. But the Bible is clear. Jesus is fully God. But then Paul kind of makes this switch, and it's kind of hard to understand. He says Jesus is fully God. And then he says Jesus was fully man. What? What? Wouldn't it be 50% God and 50% man or 99% man and 1% God? Like, like how could you be 100% of each? And it's one of the mysteries of the faith. It seems impossible to believe the both, both things at the same time. But this is what the Bible says. 
In verses 6 and 7, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, that word very nature again, deepest part of his being, made, made in human likeness. Jesus was God. He is God. He had the rights. He had a right to the privileges and the honors that were due him as God but he didn't hold on to them. He let those things go. He willingly gave them up to become man. He let the wonders and the glories of heaven to come to earth and to live in these limitations. He chose to submit to the limits of human understanding rather than tap in to the wonder and the clarity of divine perspective. He chose to set that aside. He chose to endure the limitations of an earthly body rather than bask in the freedom of the spirit. Just think, this is God. This is God who needed sleep, who had aching muscles, who experienced hunger and, and frustration and temptation. This was God. He could have spoken a word and had something take place. But instead, when he came to earth, he had to walk miles to discover the need that was needed to be met. In the Bible, we see that he faced limitations to his knowledge, to his physical endurance, and again, the need for sleep and, and eat and all those things. We see that he was God and he faced temptation just as you and I face temptation. Now, far too often we give in. Jesus faced temptation but never sinned. He felt emotions. He shared tears. There were, I'm sure that there were times when he laughed. It doesn't necessarily say that, but I don't see children running to somebody who's a grump. And so I think he laughed. Maybe even in some ways he resembled his earthly mother. Maybe somebody who knew the family would come up and say, Jesus, you look like your mom so much. He was 100% God, but he was 100% man. But in that 100% man, he faced the limitations that all of us as human face, humans face. He was God, but he didn't tap into his godness. He voluntarily put all of that aside for you and for me. And let's understand something. Jesus was not pretending to be her, her human as some religions teach. He was human. He refused to hold on to his rights. Instead, he faced the same kinds of pressures that you and I face. Same temptations and struggles that we have. And so we want to celebrate Christmas every year because Jesus is fully human. And he's fully God. But really, in a sense, the key to all of this is that not just was he those things, but we celebrate Christmas because Jesus was fully obedient. And beloved, we should be so, so thankful for that. That he chose, it says. He was found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus came to earth with a mission. And the mission was you. And the mission was me. He came to reach out to us. He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. See, the Bible is abundantly clear that each and every person who has ever born and ever will be born, born can never live up to the standards of holiness of God. Can't live up to that. We just can't do it. It's not in us. And so, in that state... We are not acceptable to God. 
Bible says God can't even look upon sin. And here's the worst thing of all. What is the punishment for sin? It's a capital offense. The punishment for sin is death. The same Paul who wrote Philippians said in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, he says that the wages of sin is death. So what can we do? That, it, it just seems such a hopeless situation that I'm a sinner. I can't be around God because of that. It's a capital offense. What happens, of course, is that Jesus becomes our payment. Jesus becomes our substitute. He traded places with us. And here's the amazing thing. His goodness and his righteousness was transferred to our account. And our sin was transferred to his account. And he did that for you. And he did that for me. When he died, he faced God's anger for us. His sacrifice was enough, more than enough, for anyone who will choose to follow him. This is probably one of the deepest and most theological passages on who Christ is. And sometimes we can get bogged down in all that. But the Bible was not given to us for information. It was given to us for transformation. And so what do we see in this passage, that's this theological passage that actually helps us to live our lives, that actually helps us to be more deeply devoted to him, freer in our celebration of Christmas? Let me tell you three practical lessons that I see here. First of all, remember the context of the passage. He tells us, Paul tells us that in all these things in the text, they're pointing to Jesus as a pattern of how we are to live our lives. He says, if you want to know what it's like to be a servant, then look to Jesus. And as we look to Jesus, we see that his example, for one thing, means wisely using the privileges that we've been given. So what does that mean? What does it mean to use wisely the privileges that we've been given. Well, maybe we can serve someone this Christmas by giving them from our abundance. Maybe we can give support to someone who is hurting. Emotional support, physical support, come alongside, let them know they're not alone. Maybe we can invite someone who's lonely to to one of our Christmas get-togethers that we're going to have as family. Maybe we can give some time to, to work in a shelter to work in a, in, in a mission. Maybe we can buy gifts for those who are needy. One of the lessons we learn here is that in Christ, we see in his life that being a servant means willing to give up our personal rights and our opportunities to benefit other people. It means that I'm not always looking at number one that my eyes are also peeled outward. How do I care for and reach out to other people? Jesus didn't cling to his rights and the honors that were rightfully his as God. And his example reminds us that the way up is down. And the way to be exalted is to serve. And the way that we know joy is to give of ourselves. So let's remember the context that This is telling us to live like Jesus. This passage tells us that it's not enough to have faith. That sounds like heresy, doesn't it? It's not enough to have faith. The real question is, where is our faith placed? Who is it placed in? That's the real question. It's not enough to think that Jesus is a good man, that he's a moral teacher. It's not even enough to think that he's a good enough person that I want to follow him. 
He's more than this. Jesus is God. Not just a good role model. Not just the leader of our club that we happen to belong to. He's not just a wonderful and a wise teacher. What we do is we acknowledge his right over our lives. That we submit, that we surrender to him. We bow before him as the ruler of the universe and the one that holds all the keys to life. Jesus is not just our favorite teacher. Jesus is our Lord and our God. Remember the context. Remember it's not enough to have faith. And then this passage deepens our wonder and celebration of Christmas. The most difficult Christmas that I ever spent in my life was in the early 70s. And I had been away from home. My parents had asked me to leave home when I was 16 because of my use of alcohol and drugs. And, and I remember being all alone at Christmas. I, a buddy of mine and I shared an apartment, and he went to his family, but my family had nothing to do with me. And the girl I was going with, her family asked me to come over later in the day. And I remember riding the bus in Calgary on Christmas Day, and there was me and the driver. And this is as vivid to me as if it happened yesterday. And even though I was going to a girlfriend's place and I knew her family well, I felt this over, overwhelming sense of holiness, of, 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 of loneliness. I can't even begin to tell you how that felt for me. I don't think I've ever felt that lonely in my entire life before or since. And you know what? I'm not the only person who has ever experienced loneliness at Christmas. Many people feel forgotten, lost, overlooked. And it's tempting for them to think that they don't matter. But what this passage tells us and if we understand the true story of Christmas, we understand that we matter greatly to God. No matter how we may feel, we matter greatly to God. And he cared so much for us that he would send his son, God, to earth to live and to die to reach out to us and to save us from destruction. Do you know what Christmas is? Christmas is an invitation. Christmas is an invitation to come home. To come home. I think it's a reminder to us who are believers where that home is. But I also think it's the people who who are just trying to walk through this whole spiritual maze and what it's all about and what it means. And I think Christmas is a call to say, come home. Come home. Come back to where you belong. He's done everything. The only thing that's left for us to do is to say, okay, I will accept the gift. I will accept that gift. And I will place my life and my confidence for all of eternity in the hands, the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here today and you've never done that. You're not even sure what it understands, what, what it means to do that. I want to encourage you today to make that decision today to come home. To come home to Jesus. Maybe you have knew him and you wandered away. Maybe you've never known in your life what it means to give your life to Jesus. Trust him. Trust him as the one who was born and died for you. Trust him to forgive you as he promised that he would. Trust him for daily life. Trust him. Follow his directions. Trust him in the hard times and trust him in the good times. 
And when you dare to do that, friends, when you dare to say, yes, I will put my hands, my life in the hands of the one who loved me and came for me. You're not only going to find him fully trustworthy every day of your lives, you're also going to discover, perhaps for the very first time, exactly why we celebrate Christmas year after year. Father, thank you for your word. Father, we can't even begin to say thank you enough for Jesus. And Father, help us not to get caught up in the the theological truths and realities that Jesus was God, 100% God and and 100% man. And Father, help us just to remember that we follow him and we can follow him. For those who have never made that decision, Lord, I pray that you would put it on their hearts today to do so. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.